let's get our hands together and get our hearts and minds prepared for worship. There is joy in this house because the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. Amen. Let's sing this out together. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Because he opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. Oh my God, he holds the victory.
God's word out loud tonight. It's gonna to be on the screen. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Let's pray. So Father, I just thank you that as we read your word, we see words about you that are true, God. That you are the one who delivers us. That you are the one who hears our cry. And God, I just ask that the words of this psalm, that they would be true of us, that we would look to you, that we would seek your face. So we adore you. Jesus, you are the one that we long for. You are the king that we are waiting for. So we love you, we adore you. Have your way in this place tonight. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. You can be seated. On January 2nd, I was asleep on our couch when my wife woke me up and said, babe, I think you need to see this. Monday Night Football was on our TV and it was just moments after DeMar Hamlin of the Buffalo Bills had collapsed on the field with cardiac arrest. They were trying to resuscitate him. They did not know, we did not know at that moment if he was going to survive or not. Immediately, the trending topics all over were pray for DeMar and thoughts and prayers as they usually are at a time like that. In fact, I saw one clip of an ESPN TV studio host who said, you know, we just say thoughts and prayers enough. We need to actually pray. And he said to the viewers watching at home, why don't you close your eyes and bow your head? I'm going to pray for us right now on live TV. And he proceeded to say a very eloquent, very meaningful prayer and said, amen. It was kind of funny to watch, uh, in retrospect, once tomorrow was okay at least, to watch the co-hosts respond to that because you could tell they did not know what was happening. They said, that was very beautiful, thank you. But it was a cool moment of not just talking about prayer, but actually praying. 
how do you approach prayer? Whenever we see a human tragedy, we also see that prayer is the human instinct to react. We weren't surprised when something went wrong with Damar Hamlin and everybody across the country said, pray. So I found some stats on prayer. Listen to these, 55% of Americans pray every day. 28% of Americans who say they have no faith say they pray every day. They don't have faith, but 28% of them say they still pray every day. Some of the stats I found were really funny. One in 20 people have prayed for someone to get fired. <laughs> Dear God, get them out of here. 13% of people pray that their favorite team would win. I have. <laughs> I've sat there during football season and literally prayed, God, I know this is about one trillionth on your priority list of prayers rolling in today, but if you could please have the Ravens win. I just need Lamar to throw a couple more touchdown passes in the fourth quarter because God, like it or not, I'm not proud of this, but you and I both know that I'm gonna be a better dad and husband the rest of the day if the Ravens win. <laughs> so if you could just take care of that, that'd be great, amen. One in five people have prayed to win the lottery. Anybody else prayed to win the lottery? I have. <laughs> You liars. <laughs> I would never buy a Powerball ticket. I agree with Dave Ramsey. I think lottery is a government tax on the poor. But my old grocery store had this thing when the Powerball got extremely high that for every $100 in groceries you bought, they would give you one free uh, Powerball ticket. So it was bad stewardship for us not to buy $2,000 worth of groceries. <laughs> but I would then pray about it and I would even negotiate with God in my prayers. I'm not making this up. I would say, God, look, I've watched the TV shows. I know how lotteries ruin people's lives and nothing good comes of it. This is why it would be in your best interest to have me win the jackpot because I'm not gonna keep any of it. In fact, I got in a little marriage tiff this morning because my wife actually wants to keep a million dollars, but I would give it all away. We were getting in a marriage fight over the lottery we hadn't won yet. And I said, God, I would give a bunch of it to our church to further ministry. I'd pay off debt of all our church plants. I'd give to those Christian colleges that are faithfully doing your work. So God, I think it's kind of in your best interest of the kingdom to give me the lottery, amen. But am I the only one who gets confused and overwhelmed by prayer? Just the nature of it sounds weird. We're gonna to talk to the creator of the universe. That's so intimidating. Then what do we say? I don't wanna sound stupid. Do I just repeat what other people have said? And then we feel pressure because scriptures teach us to pray so much. Thessalonians says, pray continually. Philippians says, pray in every situation. Colossians says, devote yourselves to prayer. There's something in human nature that wants to pray. Scripture commands us to pray, but so often we're just not sure what it looks like. We have questions about prayer. Can you change the mind of God in prayer? If so, does that make God weak? If not, should we even bother praying? Why does God answer some prayers with the yes and some prayers with the no? Because you and I both know that some of the things God has said no to seem a lot more important than some of the things he said yes to. How much of prayer should even be spent on asking things of God as opposed to being grateful or worshiping or, or maybe just sitting in silence with God? And by the way, how does that work? And it can be helpful to study those questions at times, but there's one quote that really sums up for me how I feel about prayer. It says, if I had to answer the question, why pray, in one sentence, it would be, because Jesus did. Jesus is the son of God who died and rose again. He prayed, okay, I'm in. And to take it one step farther, we have another quote, to discount prayer, to conclude that it does not matter, means to view Jesus as deluded. What I do know is we need help when it comes to prayer. And fortunately for us, Psalm 34 is gonna teach us what we need today. 
Psalm 34, as we go through it, is not going to get into the mechanics of prayer, like whether you should journal or uh, what process you should go in, or if there's a helpful acronym that would help you do your daily prayer. We have lots of Christian resources we've been exposed to on that before. But Psalm 34 is going to teach us about the inward posture of prayer. Like, what should our attitude be? How should we view God? What's the emotion that we pray with? So we're gonna walk through this psalm and we're gonna leave here today with one word that is the mindset of prayer and one phrase that gives us a handle to express it. So one word that is our attitude and one phrase to express that. Let's dig in, Psalm 34. It talks from the very beginning about the essence of prayer of being in communion with God. Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly seek his praises. I love that word constantly. The New Testament tells us to pray without ceasing. The reality is the way we grow into constant prayer is we begin with disciplined prayer. Think about it this way. When you see the sports highlights, sometimes you'll see LeBron James uh, at the end of the game shooting a fadeaway, falling sideways out of bounds while getting fouled over the backboard shot that goes in. It's absolutely amazing. How does LeBron James prepare for that? He doesn't practice falling away, fading away, getting fouled shots over the backboard. What he does do is for not just weeks, not just months, not just years, but decades, practice his shooting form over and over. He's disciplining himself, getting a certain form down so that when he gets in any situation in a game, falling forward, falling sideways, getting fouled, end of game, he has the discipline of the form down so he can then use that form in any situation that he gets put into. Christian discipline is no different. In this series, we're talking about spiritual disciplines that we train ourselves with so that when life hits us in the face, it doesn't matter which way it pulls or pushes on us. We have the form, we have the discipline from practice that we can adapt and get through it. One thing this, do, this verse does make me think of is worship music because it says, I will constantly speak his praises. And one thing that many, many Christians find helpful in prayer is worship music. It's a practical way that we can use technology to constantly speak his praises no matter where we are. Our our team's launching a worship album this weekend. It's called Sacred Space. And really the heart behind it is that whatever environment we are in, it can become a sacred space when we are doing this, when we are constantly speaking his praises. And I think that'd be a great tool if you wanna live that verse out. Psalm 34 goes on, verse two. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. So it says, let all, let us, let us. It's talking about communal prayer here. One thing we do as Christians at times is pray in groups. Kyle recently shared a story with our staff that I asked if I could share uh, with the whole church. He said, sure. And he told us how he was at a thing with some other pastors not too long ago. And he was hanging out with, I think, three other guys. And the topic of elders came up. Somebody asked, well, how often do your all's elders meet? And the first guy said, our elders meet once a year. It's really quick. And then we're done. Another guy said, well, ours meet six times a year. And two of them are basically parties. So really four kind of meetings per year. Another guy said, yeah, ours meet four times per year. Then they all looked at Kyle and said, how often do your elders meet? He said, Well, our elders meet every week. He said, whoa, what's going on? What's going on there? And he said, well, it's not what you think because once a month we have, you know, like an official elders meeting. But then he showed this picture to our staff and said, this is what our elders meeting looks like every week. And it's a group of men on their knees, even some who can't be there in person on their knees, zooming in, praying for you, praying for us, praying for God's kingdom. 
And it's our elder's way, if you look back at the Psalm of living out what it says, they're saying, hey, we're gonna get together so we can exalt his name together. I love it. Verse five continues the idea of communion with God. It says, those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. And when you think about this verse, shame, Genesis three tells us, stems from sin. The first thing that happens after sin is shame. But this verse is about grace because shame comes from sin. The person this is talking about has no shame, meaning they've been forgiven. So they have joy, which means as we pray, a result is we're reminded of grace. It's one reason we pray. Verse six, in my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. Does that verse sound familiar? In my desperation, I prayed Lord, please, let not that, please don't let that cop have seen me. God, please let me pass the test. God, help me not be pregnant. God, help me be sober and pass that test. God, help the rent check clear. God, please don't let her check the internet history. God, just do something, please. I'm desperate. You ever prayed one of those in desperation? This actually reminds me of a prayer that... I am on a personal mission to eradicate from Christian language, so I just thought it would be helpful to share. Um, it's born with good motives, it's just used in the wrong context. And you may have heard this prayer uh, used poorly when, for example, you go out to uh, your favorite fast food restaurant with your guys, and you're sitting in front of a plate of fried chicken sandwich and a big old thing of fries and a large Coke that you're gonna get three refills on. You got 17 packs of ketchup, you got the sauce to cover the fried chicken in. One of your guys says, hey, let's pray before we eat, as you should always thank God for your food. And everybody bows their heads, and then one guy says, and you can finish this for me if you've actually ever heard this before, but one person says, God bless this food to the... And here's the thing, <laughs> I believe in miracles. <laughs> I believe God will do a miracle in answer to prayer. I just don't know if that's the time that you want to pray for a miracle to ask God to transform the nutritional value of French fries and endless Coke into that of broccoli and carrots, I'm just saying. <laughs> Somebody said, well, you prayed for your team to win. Well. <laughs> Be quiet. <laughs> but let's think about this more carefully. It says, in my desperation, I prayed. And I brought up, you know, kind of the funny ways or weird ways we may pray this, but the reality is this verse, this phrase sounds bad because think about it like this. If the only time my kids come talk to me is when they're desperate for me to do something, frankly, it's gonna be annoying. It's gonna feel like we don't have a deep relationship. It's gonna look like they don't actually care about me until they need something. And I've had Christian books and pastors and podcasts kind of use that metaphor, that analogy as a push of why we should do other forms of prayer like confession as we talked about last week or, or worship or, or silence. Because if God is our father, it sounds bad to say I only go to him when I'm desperate for something. So there's a lot of Christian teaching on how do you pray when you're not desperate? And that's hard. It takes discipline. It feels tedious. It could be an obligation. And obviously we're talking about spiritual discipline. Sometimes we do things whether we feel like it or not just because it's the right thing to do. But here's what I'm learning. I'm learning that the key to prayer is not how do I pray when I'm not desperate? The key to prayer is learning I'm always desperate. Remember the story in Luke chapter seven where Jesus goes to the home of one of the religious leader Pharisees named Simon and has dinner with him? And Luke tells us that a sinful woman from that town made her way in and was kind of behind Jesus as they were talking around dinner. It's kind of Luke's code word to say everybody in this town knew that she was a prostitute and she was looked down on and people kept their distance. And it says she's overcome with emotion. She starts crying on Jesus' feet as he's sitting there at the table. So she kneels down, she undoes her hair, she wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. Then she takes her perfume, she puts that on his feet and Simon is just bewildered at this point. 
And Simon thinks in his head, if Jesus were anything special, he'd know who's touching him right now. But Jesus reads his mind and answers his thoughts. Side note, that's never going to go well for you. <laughs> he says, Simon, I got a question for you. Okay, teacher. Let me set it up with a story. There was a, a wealthy guy, money lender, who loaned money to two different people. One of them, it was 10 bucks for lunch one day. Another, it was half a million dollars for a business venture at went south. He forgave the debts of both. Simon, which of those people is more appreciative? Well, teacher, the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. Simon, you're right. Simon, I came into your house. You didn't do anything for me. But this woman wet my feet with her tears. She kissed them. She anointed them with perfume. And I tell you, she's been forgiven because she loves much. But, he, but Simon, he who has been for, forgiven little loves little. And that story used to be so confusing to me because it sounds like Jesus is saying, you know what, Simon, this woman can appreciate me more because she's just sinned more than you. So Simon, it sounds like Jesus is saying, if you really want to appreciate me, go out and sin like crazy. Like leave the little Pharisee thing for a little while and go out and do everything you've ever dared to dream of in your sinful state. Combine the sin of the greediest Wall Street executive with that of the wildest college partier with that of the most hardened inmate in for life. Put them all together, go even deeper than that. And then when you hit rock bottom, come back to me and repent. And Simon, when you do that, you're really gonna appreciate me. It kind of sounds like that's what Jesus is saying. Problem is that doesn't go along with anything else Jesus ever teaches elsewhere. So what's Jesus saying? He's not saying, Simon, she's a worse sinner than you. He's teaching, Simon, you have no idea how bad of a sinner you really are. Or to use Psalm 34 language, he's saying, Simon, you have no idea how desperate you really are. See, the key to growing in prayer is not learning, how do I pray when I'm not desperate? The key is learning, I'm always desperate. Do you know the Avengers movie with um, Bruce Banner and he's getting ready to turn into the Hulk and somebody says to him, you better get angry. And he turns and faces the camera. He says, that's my secret. I'm always angry. And the Christian who has a close walk with the Lord, knows that's my secret. I'm always desperate. Now I get that that word desperate doesn't sound appealing, like you don't wanna date someone who's desperate, right? But look at these words that the scriptures use to describe us. Drowning, thirsty, in darkness, lost, orphans, alone. Sounds pretty desperate to me. And I'll repeat, the challenge is not how do we pray when we're not desperate? The challenge is how do we recognize how desperate we really are? Well, Psalm 34 shows us. Keep reading. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Fear the Lord, you his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. So he's talking a lot about fearing the Lord. But contrast this to another verse in this same Psalm. It says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. So verses seven, nine, 11, fear the Lord, fear the Lord, fear the Lord. The other verse says he freed me from all my fears. What he wants us to understand is when you fear God, it displaces fear of everything else. He mentions four times that it is a good thing to have a fear of God. But here's what we do. We mix up 1 Peter 2, 17. 1 Peter 2, 17 in the New Testament says, fear God, honor the king. Fear God, honor the king. We fall into a trap where we switch that. We honor God, we do. But we fear the HR policy at work. We fear uh, the teacher. We fear the relational status. We fear the bank account balance. We fear the unknown prognosis. 
And what Psalm 34 teaches, same thing as 1 Peter does, if we fear God, we won't fear anything else. We'll honor the king, we will. But fear of God is what puts everything else in its right place. Here's our challenge though, we know this. We know, if you're a Christian at least, that we should tremble before the living God, before his might and his power and his glory. But we find ourselves still falling into this habit of honoring God and fearing the circumstance. We can't always will our emotion to go to a certain place, but we can put ourselves in environments that take our emotions where they need to go. Two years ago, my family was blessed uh, by our former church with a sabbatical for the summer. And we did something that we had been saving for for years. We went on a massive national parks trip out west. And we climbed on boulders in Joshua Tree and we peered over the edge of the rails at the Grand Canyon. And we hiked among the hoodoos at Bryce and repelled in Moab. It was just fantastic. We experienced God's best handy, handiwork. And we found ourselves just naturally saying one word over and over again. It was this word, wow. So we'd hike up to see a waterfall, wow. We'd view the Rocky Mountains on horseback, wow. We'd see otherworldly things at Yellowstone, wow. We were just stunned at God's creation. But it went beyond for me just being in awe. It went actually to a fear of creation. My family kind of teased me for this, but before we went to each national park, I get on my phone and look up the phrase, deaths in blank national park. (laughs) Because every year people die in these various national parks and I wanna know how they died so I didn't go on that same trail, do the same thing they had done. And it would make my palms sweat and it would make my heart race, but then the result of that is when we were by a thousand foot cliff, when we were by a waterfall that could sweep us over if we crossed the rail, it didn't just put me in all of creation, it put me in all, and I would even say fear of the one who had made those things. So when I looked at that and thought of him, my heart raced and my palms got sweaty. And like the psalmist, I said, God, I, I fear you, I do. And just so we're clear, when 1 Peter talks about fearing God, it's the word phobos, which does not mean awe. It does not mean reverence. It means means terror. It means sweaty palms and racing heart. And when we do that, Psalm 34 says, we don't fear what's in front of us. See, when I fear God, it puts me in my right perspective. It puts sin in its right perspective, which in turn leads me to being desperate for God. I believe an essential part of healthy prayer is putting yourself in environments that help you fear God. Men, for most men I know, it's somewhere in nature. For me, it's the Rocky Mountains. When I get there, I fear God. For my buddy Scott, it's when he's at the beach. Because when he's there in the morning, he sees the calm. It reminds him of the peace of God. When he's there after a storm and it's rough, it reminds him of the power of God and he trembles. For my buddy Matt, he has to go backpacking in the wilderness at least once a year. It's man versus nature and nature beats him down and he does his best to get through it and he absolutely loves being deep beat down because it's not about him versus nature. It's, for, it's him with the creator and he is reminded of the God who made it all and he stands in fear. For other people, it is other things. I have a buddy who says, for me, it's theology books. When Carl reads theology books, it helps me fall asleep. When my buddy reads theology books, it helps him fear God. For my wife, it's when she holds a newborn baby. She just stares at that beautiful thing and she is in awe, and I would even say, in fear of the one who can create life from nothing. I talked to a surgeon one time. He said, it's when I'm in surgery. He said, I can kind of put it together, but to think that God could create this, it just, it makes me tremble. What is it for you? What experience, what place, what activity puts God in his right place? Because the trap we fall into is we honor God and we fear the king. But look at it again. It says, we, it blesses, look at it, it blesses all who fear him. Fear the Lord, fear him, fear the Lord. 
Now, if we leave it there, it sounds bad. Like fear the Lord, that's where it ends? No, because look at the next verse. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. When our desperation collides with a healthy fear of God, the Lord draws close to those who are hurting. And catch what this verse means. The word brokenhearted means you're crushed. Something's pushing down on you. This word over here really means contrite within you. So the verse is saying, whether it's something outside that's pushing down on you or whether it's something inside that you are dealing with, the Lord is close to you no matter what. The Lord's close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. Now, the reason David, who wrote this psalm, says this is because of what he's facing. Beginning of Psalm 34 tells us David was not yet King David. David was Shepherd David, and there was King Saul. King Saul was trying to hunt and kill David. So at this point, David had run to a foreign country for safety. He had befriended the king there, whose name was Achish, and had found asylum, had found sanctuary and safety. Eventually, though, that country is going to go to war against Israel. As their soldiers are lining up for battle, David, and I guess he's thinking, maybe I can find Saul along the way, lines up with them. But those soldiers point out to King Achish, hey, he was born over there. How do we know he's not going to turn against us in battle and start working for them? Get him out of here. Well, at this point, David gets scared that he's going to be executed for being a spy. So the scriptures say David pretended to be insane. He started scratching the walls. He started having drool come down in his beard and was just pretending this whole thing. It worked. King Achish said, hey, look at this guy. We got enough crazy people out here. Get him out of here. So 1 Samuel 22, look at it. It says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming. Men who were in trouble or in debt or were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 of them. In fact, I love the message paraphrase of this. Look at it. All who were down on their luck came around, losers and vagrants and misfits of all sorts. So David's living in a cave. He's running for his life. He's with a bunch of misfits. And he writes a song. And he says, you know who God's close to? The misfits and the losers and the vagrants and, and the contrite and the brokenhearted. It's everyone who said, God, I tried to do life without you. I can't. And it's not even that I simply want you. I need you. And realizing how desperate we are and how amazing the God we fear is, we can say with David, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The Lord is close to us. The Lord rescues us. So if you have not given your life to Jesus, I have to ask, are you misfit? Are you brokenhearted? Are you crushed? Are you in trouble or discontented? The Lord wants to draw you close. In fact, Psalm 34 says, the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. This verse is ultimately pointing to eternity, meaning you are a sinner. And the way you take refuge in him is to humble yourself, to repent, to be baptized, and to be saved by calling on the name of the Lord to save you. I told you I'd give you one word today. The word's desperate, right? I told you I'd give you a handle, one, one phrase as a handle. What I want to do is I want to teach you what is my favorite prayer. I, I call it the best prayer ever. It's not the Lord's Prayer, although I'm sure that really is the best prayer ever. It's a prayer my sister taught me uh, years ago now. And I've prayed it phew, thousands of times since she taught me. We were on a family vacation together and you know, we got a bunch of kids around and it's getting to be bedtime. So my sister says, hey, I'm gonna go put my daughter, uh, my niece, her daughter, to bed and she disappears for a little while. Then she comes back out to join all the adults and 
She said, okay, I just got done praying with her. You know, what are we talking about? And I said, you prayed with her? Because my niece was so young, she, she couldn't even really spring, uh, string together sentences. It was just, you know, word here, word there, word there. And was, she's at that stage of picking it up pretty quick, but couldn't really carry on a conversation. So I said, How, how's that prayer work? And my sister was kind of embarrassed. She goes, well, it's a simple prayer. And I said, what is it? And she said, well, I, I just have her repeat after me. And I say, Jesus. And she says, Jesus. And I say, help, help, amen, amen. Jesus, help, amen. It is the desperate cry of a heart who trembles before a God who is worthy of being feared. And when you think about it, most every prayer you pray has that idea in it. It's Jesus, my job situation's in limbo and I'm not sure what to do because it wasn't just no raise, it's they're doing layoffs next week and this is the only thing I'm qualified to do and I don't know where I'd find more work and people are counting on me to feed them, Jesus. Jesus, help. It's God, I'm mad at you. And I'm not even sure that's allowed, but it's just how I feel, so I need to tell you because you haven't fixed the situation. Jesus, help. It's Lord... We think we'd be great parents. We're trying everything. Jesus, help. It's, Lord, I'm gonna give you my life because I've tried and it's not just that I want you, I need you. So Jesus, help. And you know what happens when you ask for help? This is so great. Look at the Psalm. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. Isn't that great? So here's how I wanna wrap up, is I wanna lead you in prayer. I'm gonna walk through a few different scenarios and it'll make sense as we go, but when I say that scenario, I will then say Jesus, and if that particular scenario applies to you, you can say out loud Jesus and I'll say help, and if that particular scenario applies to you, then you just say help. Um, so if you want to, you can just put your hands in your lap, kind of open like this to physically represent being desperate for God. Uh, it probably will help you to close your eyes, but you can do what you want in this moment. Let's pray. Jesus, some of us face marriage struggles right now. Some of us, that means we're staring divorce in the face. For others, our marriage is just meh. We don't like it. We want something better. We want our marriage to be a safe, fun place. So Southeast, if you need prayer for your marriage, repeat after me, Jesus, help. Lord, some of us are struggling as parents. We're all over the spectrum. We have a prodigal or praying comes home. We, we have a newborn and can't sleep. We have a teenager. We don't know how to discipline and, and at the same time give more freedom. We feel lost and inadequate. If that applies to you, repeat after me. Jesus, help. Jesus, a lot of us are confused about calling. We're trying to figure out what's next whether it's go to college or what to do after college or even feeling a tug to a second career. We're scared and intimidated and not sure we're good enough. So repeat this if it's true. Jesus, help. Lord, some of us need to confront someone in the loving spirit of Matthew 18, but we're scared. We want somebody else to do it. But we feel your tug and we need courage. So Jesus, help. God, a lot of us need to confess. And we sat in church last week through a powerful sermon and powerful testimony and we did nothing. Crucify our pride, Jesus, we need to come clean. Repeat after me, Jesus, help. Lord, a lot of us are facing mental health struggles and we're doing all the things. We've got the doctor and the Christian therapist. We're involved with our church family, but Jesus, our worst enemy doesn't even seem to be the devil. It seems to be our own mind. 
We wish we could escape it and we can't. And we know you say, don't worry about tomorrow. And that is our biggest obstacle. We're depressed or anxious or obsessed and we hate it. And we just wish you would free us from what's between our own ears. So Lord, all we know to do is to pray this prayer, Jesus, help. God, we're lonely. It's hard. We know at its essence, church is Christ-centered community, but we're not feeling it. Help us not give up on initiating. Give us deep friendships, Lord. Jesus, help. God, so many of us are concerned about changing the world out there, but the reality is we are not letting you into the dark places of our soul, where our insecurity lives, where past trauma still hides, and where our unhealthy anger and sadness are born. We need you, Lord, to deal with that part of us, but we are scared. We're not sure what people would think if they knew it's even there. We're not even sure you can fix it, but we want to take the risk to see. So Jesus, help. Lord, we are desperate for you. All of us are nothing, you are everything. We are small, you are big. We are sinners, you are perfect. We are anxious, you are calm. We are hateful, you are love. We hide, you bring light. We are lost, you are our savior. Jesus, we need you. We are desperate for you. So Southeast, let's all say together, Jesus, help. Jesus, help, amen. Will you stand right now? We are gonna lead out of Psalm 34 into a worship song that we haven't done in a couple years, but captures what Psalm 34 is all about. And I don't know where prayer begins and worship ends or vice versa, but I just know this song will help lead us to the God who's close to the brokenhearted and those who are contrite and crushed. Let's worship our Savior together. This is my 